Our Council for Inclusive Excellence is a college-wide body, members from our staff, our students, and our faculty that bring together the, the workforce and the ideas behind trying to get our inclusive excellence, diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies forward. So welcome, and without uh, further ado, I wanna introduce our guest today. As with many things related to DEI, we can't do this work as an individual. It takes many of us on the council, also many individuals in the college also very committed to, do, to working on DEI initiatives. For the DEI office, we have three uh, star players that help immensely in the work, including our work study students. And one of those um, is our guest today, um, Mavis Majura. Um, the other two I'll give a shout out to, Aaron Chanel and Danielle Green, who will be starting with the office. And um, my work study student, who is just amazing, Jewel Heald. So here we go. Um, Mavis Majora, our guest today, is a doctoral candidate for organizational leadership psychology at William James College. She is an author, leadership coach, international behavioral science and performance specialist, OD consultant, and practitioner with expertise in human dynamics in organizations. She's a multiple award-winning global training and development leader, coach, and author of several books, including Self-Leadership, Navigating the Rapid Waves of Life, 10 Lessons to Managing Emotions for Success, Managing Emotions for Financial Freedom and Others. She's also a trainer, facilitator, and keynote speaker at public and private engagements. Mavis has studied in the Netherlands, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and the United States and has a diversity of experience with a truly global cosmopolitan mindset. She has presented papers at international conferences, including Harvard Medical School, Boston, Women's University in Hanoi, Vietnam, University of Notre Dame, Australia, Waset in Istanbul, Turkey, where she was presented with the best speaker award in, in February, 2020. In her personal life, she enjoys being a wife and mother of two very intelligent boys. Please join me in welcoming Mavis Majura. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, um, Gloria. I appreciate that introduction. It's always scary to listen when someone is reading your bio. Um, yeah, just wondering, is that me? All right, awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, I think because we've got a couple of minutes together, I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to give a context of why we are talking about equity mindedness today. So um, in uh, August, September 2020, I joined the DEI office for my practicum. And um, the ask or the presenting problem was design a metric to measure uh, or quantify DEI at William James College. Um, and as I have been schooled at William James College, um, when you get a presenting problem, you have to get into the system and understand the, system, you know, the problem for yourself. Um, so with that, I then engaged um, with um, Gloria to sort of, you know, get closer to the problem and say, um, you know, can I understand this problem? Um, what is going on? And so I got access to, you know, climate surveys at William James College. I got access to um, um, strategic plans around DEI at William James College. And with the data and information, I sort of came up with a couple of hypotheses or assumptions. And I think I'll just mention three of those that I came up with. And the first one was, um, it is an adaptive challenge, right? When we talk DEI, we are talking about, you know, it's an adaptive challenge. It's not a technical, there's no prescription. There's a lot of learning that is required. And um, so with that adaptive challenge with the accompanying archetypes that I'm not gonna get into right now. Um, my second one was, um, other gaps, um, sort of other gaps and um, the strength for DEI at William James College, empirically none. And with that, I was looking at, have we actually done a DEI, a, 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 a DEI organizational assessment to see where we are in terms of DEI empirically? But also, have we also done an equity, an equity uh, audit to see where exactly where we are? And then the third one was, um, is there a shared understanding around 
uh, DEI. So even though we want to measure, we can't measure if there isn't any shared understanding because then there will be the practice and the policies might not necessarily be speaking to what we're trying to get to. So, and then I was also particularly just interested in equity mindedness uh, training in particular. Um, and the reason I'll explain that as we go along. So is there a shared understanding around DEI? Um, and has there been like equity mindedness training at William James College? And the reason for that, the rationale is that, you know, DI is such a complex matter and we all know this. Um, and, um, you know, it requires, um, um, what is it? It requires collaboration. Um, it requires a stakeholder engagement uh, for us to be able to have joint uh, problem solving um, around DI. So that's what got us here, that hypothesis on has there been a shared understanding of um, is there a shared understanding of DEI and particularly has there been training on equity mindedness training? And so this is what got us to be talking about um, equity minded, um, equity mindedness. And with that context, I want us to start with a small, a short survey. So I'm going to just stop sharing here and pull up my um, uh, mentee. So if you can just in the meantime, pull up your devices, your phones, and we're going to just do a quick survey. Um, and I'm just checking, uh, Gloria, please confirm if you can see my mentee. Go ahead and share it because I don't think I see it. You'd have okay. to share your screen again. Yeah, okay. Okay, and now you can see it. All right, so the instructions are pretty simple. Uh, using any device, you can go to www.menti.com and use the code. 9947346, which is at the top of what's on the shared screen here. And you'll see this um, pop up. Okay, so if we can just, uh, you know, answer that to the best of our own understanding of those uh, questions that are coming up. And um, Okay, we have got 12 voices for the sake of time. I'm gonna to try to make us spend at least like, you know, 30 seconds, the most, to, at, at most 45 seconds on a slide um, so that we can um, get to our content. So I'm gonna move on so long. So we've got 14 voices on this one. So I'm gonna move on to the next one. Okay. Okay, we've got 15 voices. I'm 15 voices. I'm gonna move on so long. Okay, moving on to the next one, sorry for that.
Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. I wish we could come back to this and redo this after the session. But I think for the purposes of time, I think it just kind of gives us um, an indication if you're seeing the results as they were coming on um, in terms of where we are in terms of our mindset, right? So equity mindedness is a, is, is a mindset, right? And the mindset we bring to DI determines the policies that we come up with. It also shapes the practices that we um, you know, engage in, whether it is in the classroom, whether it is at an institutional level, right? So the mindset we have determines um, 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 you know, the practices that we engage in, um, in shaping DEI. So I'm gonna get straight into um, the content here. So allow me to just share my screen and my content. So equity mindedness as I've shown as shared the context and I think also, um, you know, just talking about um, we have heard of diversity and inclusion for years and years right diversity inclusion diversity inclusion and it is lately that we started seeing diversity equity and inclusion. And it is interesting to see why now are we adding equity into the equation, why is that that we are adding equity into the equation, and I think equity does. Um, you know acknowledge when we're talking about equity it's acknowledging the fact that we're not starting from the same place right. We are not starting from the same place. If we go back historically, we know that there is, you know, um, you know, uh, segregation laws that prevented us, excluded a certain group of people from, you know, accessing whether it was education or from the economic system. So we acknowledge with equity, we are saying we do acknowledge that it is not enough to explain the gaps in representation by the um, by social socioeconomic status or just you know explaining it as poverty, right? We know that more many organizations have been investing in diversity and inclusion. An example is Google, right? $265 million that they spent between 2014 and 2016 in an effort to increase diversity in their own um, organization to no avail. They are known for an employee that was fired for writing a murmur against diversity, right? So while we know that diversity is a given, it's not a choice, there's nothing we can do about diversity, it's given, it's there, right? Okay, but inclusion is an option and that is inclusion that requires time, effort and energy, right? So we know that we are not starting from the same place as a result of historical, um, you know, um, practices and policies that were enacted to benefit, a, um, you know, a particular group of people and in this instance to benefit um, white people mostly and exclude uh, people of color and that's why we still struggle to find that even though we explain it as socioeconomic status, it's not enough to actually explain why there is still gaps in representation despite all the efforts that the organizations are making um, to sort of increase diversity in their own organizations. And that is why we need to discuss and talk about equity. And that is why we are now seeing diversity, equity, and inclusion instead of just seeing diversity and inclusion, right? So what is equity really? It is a state of quality or ideal of being just, impartial, and fair, right? It is a state of being, um, it is a state of quality or ideal of being just, impartial, and fair, right? And then what is systemic equity? So we realize that, um, you know, uh, the historical background that has created inequities and inequalities is not just at an individual, but it has also been uh, embedded within the systems, right? Within the uh, organizational system. So when we talk about systemic equity, what are we really referring to? So systemic equity is the interrelated elements designed to create and sustain social justice. So we realize that to address equity or imbalances, we cannot just, you know, um, you know, not address the policies and the practices as well that are perpetuating the imbalance in the imbalances and the gaps that we continue to see. And then you would realize that as we talk about equity, we are going to focus really on racial equity. We could talk about gender equity, but I think there is one subject for years that we've been you know, not really addressing or talking about, which is racial equity, right? So why do we need to be talking about racial equity? And I think you know the trends have shown that, especially this decade has started with the demand for social justice, which has actually you know, sort of uh, driven most organizations to relook at their practices and their policies. So why talk about race? I think the demographic imperative, why we should be talking about race is that we realize that um, demographers are predicting that in the US, it will become a majority minority nation by year 2044. And I remember taking international org theory, one of the classes that I took last semester, um, where my professor was actually saying, it's actually happening. And I've been sitting back just recently as I was preparing for this wondering, I wonder what the impact of the pandemic will be 
if it was already happening, that it's already a majority minority nation, right? And then we have the economic imperatives, right? If we don't address the, imper the inequalities and if we don't address the imbalances, if we have an imbalanced system, we all pay. We're gonna use taxpayers' money to you know, address social security issues or so social grants, whatever the case might be, right? So we all pay if we don't, we have a system um, that is imbalanced. So instead, if we're thinking about the economic future of the US, uh, we need everybody to be fully functioning and participating in the economy, right? And then we've got the justice imperative. So we're talking about, we know we've got a history in the past where certain laws uh, you know, were, were um, you know, created to benefit a particular group of people while excluding another, marginalizing another group. So if we're talking about justice here, we're talking about how do we bring that restorative justice, the fact that we realize that you know, there's a past we have that has brought us to where we are and perpetuated the inequalities and the imbalances that we see ourselves you know, having to deal with in, in in, in this decade. And then you've got the racial equity, which really just follows from the justice, from the justice uh, imperative to say, if we know that there's a historical background where that created imbalances around race, um, we need to go back and talk about how do we build that racial equity? How do we build that racial equity? And talking about racial equity, we then realize, as we said, you know, we realize that, you know, the laws that were created then institutionalized racism, right? Institutionalized racism. And what does that mean? At an institutional level, um, what are the policies and practices that reinforce racist standards within a particular workspace or organization, right? So if you think of William James College as an example and as an institution, you wanna ask yourself, why is it a particular group of people when they are hired, say we are hiring staff, for example, right? We are hiring staff and we find that uh, staff or professors of color, they are jumping out regularly. They are resigning regularly. They are not sustained. They are not able to stay within the institution. What is it that is within our institution that is making a certain group of people unable to have tenure? in a particular organization, just as an example, right? And then also we look at the students. We are a higher education system, right? Uh, um, and I remember I did one practicum with a particular organization in Boston. And I remember, you know, I was coming for residence and my boss said, let's meet, let's meet. And I went to this organization, excited to meet my boss. I got there and the receptionist um, was a black woman. And when I got there, I think she asked me three, four times, who am I here to see? And I had explained, I did tell her who I was there to see. And I think at the back of her mind, it was like, no, you can't be here to see her. And it would only dawned on me later why she had to ask me three, four times who I was there to see. And until I think I remember, you know, I, I, I'm guilty of, I became irritable. And then I was like, I need to see so-and-so, please can you kindly tell them that I'm here, like with a voice that was like, you know what, I, you are now wasting my time, right? <laughs> and the, the reason is, so as I, as, as, as I then had that conversation with her, I went to, I helped myself to the lobby, to the waiting area. And so as I was sitting in the waiting area, I turned to my right, there was a boardroom and there was a meeting and it was an all white boardroom meeting. There was all white and all of them had turned towards me to look at me. And on my left was another boardroom and all of them had also turned towards me. And I remember saying to myself, sorry, excuse me for the French, but I remember saying to myself, oh shit, what, what am I, what, you know, what, what am I in for, you know, luckily my boss then came and she took me to the office and with such a great meeting, she was such a, you know, a nice person and we had a great meeting and then I left and I came for residence. So you can see what are the policies and practices that in organizations, we're still struggling to have representation, there are still gaps. How do we explain when you get into an organization and you see an all white community, how do you explain that in a social system where there are also other people of, you know, of different colors? What is your rationale? What is your justification to explain what is going on? And then you have the structural one where we are talking about, you know, you have an institution that is fitting into the workplace, right? And so the certain group of people have had access to an outcome um, at the same time. So they're gonna fit into the workplace in a particular institution. So you, you see how everything is so coordinated and continues to exclude a certain, you know, a certain group or a certain, uh, you know, people. So multiple institutions collectively upholding uh, racist policies and practices in society, right? And then you have the interpersonal where, you know, even if you got into that institution, we've been given access. The reason you don't last is because you then have, you know, 
you know, uh, other people with racist acts and microaggressions that are carried out towards you, that it becomes unsustainable for you to actually remain in that institution. You eventually have to leave anywhere, right? And then you've got the internalized, which is the subtle and overt messages that are reinforced, um, you know, negative beliefs and self-hatred um, among, um, you know, a group of people. So sometimes, you know, you see that it's well-meaning, well-intentioned, but because a person does not understand issues of race, they can trigger and re-traumatize a certain group of people to the extent that while even if, and if you're in a classroom, you're dealing with a subject matter, right? Um, you're thinking we are dealing with the subject matter, but a particular group of people is affected in a negative way to the extent that the emotional investment for going through that class is more than just we are dealing with the subject because then they get re-traumatized and there's no sort of, you know, someone who will come and say, you know, um, you know, how are you doing? How do we help you? Or, or things like that just as, a, as an example so we need to understand these four dimensions of race and racism and see how do we then come to the issue of equity if we are going to address e equity we are not saying um you know as we said diversity is inevitable it's there it's given right so a lot of the organizations, the approach to increasing diversity is that we're giving you access. You can apply for a job. You can apply for uh, for uh, uh, what is it for uh, to learn to 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 learn in this institution, right? But we are realizing more and more that access is not equal to outcomes. So if we get into an institution, we get in as maybe ten white people, five black people. At the end of the four years, how many black people dropped out? Okay, how many black people dropped out, and why is that? Okay. And then so we realizing equal access does not equal uh, does not equal outcomes so outcomes are measurable so if we are wanting to increase equity right we need to have those measurable goals that speaks to if we are giving if we want equity uh, to increase equity i'm um, sorry um, um to close the equity gaps and increase diversity we have to have measurable outcomes not just access but also outcomes in the process so what is equity mindedness really so equity mindset is, is, is a mindset, right? It is a cognitive frame, a mental map of attitudes and beliefs a person maintains to make sense of the world. How do you explain gaps in diversity, right? Your mental model is the one that, you know, either you use stereotypes or whatever explanation you have, right? So the mental model, the mindset you bring to DEI is the one that you know you use to explain the equity gaps or the lack of you know agency or you know the policies or the lack of reviewing of the policies and things like that right so equity mindedness is a cognitive frame it's a mindset that we bring to dei right and this mindset is not something that you can just work up with we know we just said you know there's a subject we've been avoiding which is race we've not been having conversations that we are now having glad to be at william james uh, college at such a time as this where you know we are all engaging and people are willing uh, to be engaging on the subject matter that is uh, probably difficult to have right so with an equity mindedness uh, mindset, a practitioner, whether it is a professor in the classroom or an administrator of the university, they are willing to sort of assess their own racialized assumptions. They acknowledge that they have, you know, not enough knowledge around the history of race and racism, and they are willing to build that knowledge. Okay. They are willing to take responsibility to say, I realize that, um, you know, there is a reason why we have inequities and, and inequalities. It's because of this historical background we have. And I want to take responsibility to find how I could increase or how I could um, sort of, um, what is it, um, help the underserved uh, people uh, to increase that, uh, to sort of close that particular gap. Okay. So with that, I am asking us to sort of break out into uh, breakout rooms. Um, Gloria, are you there? And I just want us in those breakout rooms to just identify, look at William James College as an institution, identify one equity gap, just one. Okay, and we're going to do that for five minutes and we're going to be back in the main room. Five minutes um, in your conversation, identify one equity gap. When you look at William James College, what is the one equity gap that you sort of identify or you can see? Thanks, Aaron, for coming back. Sorry about that. That's okay. No way I'm talking. 
<clears throat> hello, hello, it's going well. Where'd Mavis go? She went into a breakout? Yeah, she should leave, huh? She's probably like, hi, my people. <laughs> Oh, she's in a good room. She's with her, her chair and her field placement. Is she with Catherine? Yeah, I can't remember how many minutes I she said. Yeah, she's with Catherine and then Darlene. That's where I was. I was like, oh, I hate to leave Catherine, but I'm out. Stay, but you know, everyone's okay. I'm gonna give everybody. Seven minutes? What do you think? No, no, we don't have that time. I think she said like three. Four minutes? Yeah. Say two minutes. Or maybe she's talking so fast. She can't help it though. She has to. Yeah, she's doing a good job. I should have looked at the survey one more time. I think there's someone who's going to be Captain Obvious and tell me there were spelling mistakes. Um, oh, well. I couldn't. Yeah, <clears throat> it was fast. So. And they don't know that you did it. They might think Mavis did it. So people right. always looking for something and someone to blame. Just let them do it. Haters gonna let them rot. Haters gonna. That's hate. right. Just let them rot and walk around them. <laughs> I'm closing the rooms because it will give them a 60 minute warning. Okay. Just one equity gap. That's. I mean, you don't need five minutes to identify one equity gap. Mavis, you you went flying, but then you went flying to like the perfect group with your chair and field placement director. So I was like, that's great. <laughs> they probably want to say hi anyway. <laughs> You're doing great, Mavis. It's good to see you. <laughs> this is awesome. I love it. Yeah. Mavis, I have to leave a little early because I got a back to back. So if I do apologies in advance. Thank you for jumping in. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. So delighted to get to. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. Thank you for all right, folks. All welcome time. back. So we're gonna have folks put whatever equity gap you came up with into the chat. Uh, so one person in your group can just type the equity gap that you identified into your chat, please. And then we're just going to give people a minute to do that. Um, just type in the chat box what you discuss, what you found.
it's a good response. Okay, thank you for that. Um, keep those um, you know gaps coming in. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Awesome. I think we move on. So as we're talking about equity mindedness, we're saying your mindset that you bring to DEI determines um, the policy, the practice that you engage in because of the frame you come in. So there are different cognitive frames. The first one is the diversity frame. So when people have a diversity frame, all they're saying is access. We're giving access to people of different backgrounds into our community. Um, we're giving people, you know, we, we, diversity has got different, you know, areas to speak. It can be gender, uh, it can be personality, it can be all those things. So with the diversity, we are saying we're giving, you know, an opportunity or the way we look at it is that, you know, access is given to people of, you know, different backgrounds or unique differences um, if they come into an institution. And then you've got the deficit uh, mindset, right? So how do we explain the issue of, you know, gaps that are occurring? So as an effort to try and explain some of the gaps that we find ourselves with, um, people start looking at the deficit, like people start looking at an individual's personality and character as the reason why we are unable to actually close the gap. So the stereotypes that we begin to perpetuate in a, in a way to try and explain why we are not, you know, having or building an inclusive culture. And then the equity does realize, as I said, we are starting from different um, places. We are not starting from the same place. There's a group of people that has got so many barriers in their way. And as much as it might look like it's the same distance, but the obstacles that we are dealing with are not the same, right? So as a practitioner, whether as an administrator or as, a, um, 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 as an educator, you then begin to understand that, um, you know, the, 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 the barriers that a certain group of people have is preventing them from, um, you know, from having equal outcomes, even though they may have access, but equal outcomes we're not getting. And then with no equal outcomes, then it then perpetuate, you know, organizational uh, gaps that we then find uh, ourselves with where there's still lack of representation because we are not having equal outcomes in the educational system, right? So this acknowledges that we are not starting from the same place. A certain group of people has got so many barriers in their way. What can we do to sort of reduce some of these barriers for them so that they can also begin to not just only have access, but also equal outcomes? Um, in the process. So an equity minded practitioner, what does it, what do they do? Assess your own racialized assumptions, right? Acknowledge you have, you still need to build a lot of, you know, knowledge around race and racism, but also the historical background. Um, what can you do? Use agency to sort of take some of those barriers out of the way for people of color, especially uh, for them to succeed. Okay. And with that, I want us to look at this quick case study, right? Um, and I'm going to ask us to respond, to respond in the chat box, right? So this case study, you have a group of students that are starting off, okay? So the group constitutes of four black, four black Americans, one Filipino, 10 white Americans. And the welcome by the professor to this particular class is, I just want to share with you what you'll experience. You're starting off at 16 in this cohort. Um, but when you finish, they may be just over half of you. Okay, to be one of those that will finish, you have to invest time, effort into the academic activities, seek out faculty and counselors, and visit tutors and help centers. If you do not take time, uh, if you don't take advantage of support resources, or really ask questions or seek help, it may lead to low academic success rate. What mindset is this welcome? Is it diversity? Is it deficit? Is it equity? What mindset is this welcome? Okay. What mindset is this? Okay. Right. And then what are the stereotypes? What are the assumptions hidden in this welcome? What are the stereotypes that are in this welcome? Hmm. Underlying assumption that many students will not, and, and unless you know, threatened. Okay. Any other assumptions that you're seeing? What is hidden in that welcome? What are the stereotypes, assumptions? Everyone has access and time. Um, asking questions is, is is accessing resources, right? Okay. 
okay, students are lazy, try to avoid, yeah, resources will be needed. Um, okay, awesome. And then what is the, what is the, what is the, the, the programming to the other students? So as we are listening there, so I think, you know, classrooms are where we develop people, right, for the workplace or for society, right? So whatever we are doing and saying, we are modeling, but we are also programming, right? What programming are the students receiving? So as they leave the institution as practitioners, what are we programming them? What are we training them? It's a warning, not welcome, Erin. <laughs> yeah, students are distracted. Okay. Okay. It's a matter of how a, a, a student reacts to it, competitiveness. Some will finish, some will not. Not everyone can succeed. Competition, scarce tactic. Okay. What are we programming the students in this classroom? Deficit, right? Deficit and certain hidden stereotypes that if in the end, um, you know, in second semester, for example, we now have, um, you know, two black students that are left, we are indicating in some form or fashion, it's because of their personality and character. It's because they didn't seek out the resources that were available. It's because they didn't reach out. Um, yet we are saying there are obstacles in the way for a certain group of people, yeah, okay. Um, and how do we identify those people? Because then in this assumption, this, this, this um, sort of welcome is assuming everybody's at, at the same place. Yeah, we are assuming that everybody in that classroom is starting at the same pace, which is not true really, as we have spoken about it to say we've got these equity gaps. It depends on also on where the students are being, um, you know, for them to join this particular institution. What is their background? What schools are they coming from? What support have they received from where they are coming from? What financial resources do they have available to them for them to be able to complete that, um, you know, college um, institution, um, whatever, uh, call the whole um, college program, right? Okay. So what are some of the competences? How can we build or become equity minded Or what are the competences? How would you know that this person is equity minded Or how can you uh, begin to nurture your own equity mindedness as an individual, right? So one of the competences is be aware of racial identity, right? So we cannot continue to say we don't see race. Race is there. We start from different uh, backgrounds. There's bias, there's racial inequity. It's a given, it's there. We need to acknowledge it and um, you know, acknowledge that it exists. Use quantitative and qualitative data to identify the racialized patterns of practice and outcomes, right? What are we doing to assess the patterns if students come in, um, you know, when we look at the data, when you look at the grades, for example, at the end of the semester, are we seeing the patterns in terms of how a certain group of people is doing, right? And if a certain group of people is doing well than the other group of people, why, what is it in the system that supports a certain group of people over another group of people, right? Why are, is a certain group of people struggling? So we need to really use quantitative and qualitative data to identify patterns within the institution, whether it is also even when we are hiring, right? Are we using this in our hiring processes so that we can identify the patterns? Who's, who applies and who sits in the hiring room? So we need all this data for us to be, if we're committed to be um, you know, increasing diversity or even to be inclusive or building an inclusive culture, we need to look at all this and we need relevant empirical evidence or data that we have. And then does not, um, um, so the person who is, does not have an, a, a lack of, who has a lack of equity minded, does not see value in using data disaggregated, uh, disaggregated by race or ethnicity uh, to better understand the experience of racially minoritized groups, right? And then reflects on the racially, uh, sorry, the equity-minded competence reflects on racial consequences of taken for granted practices. So as I was doing a research for this um, particular conversation, I came across a video and I'm gonna say it is in the, in the, um, uh, to, in the resources. And I was listening to this um, guy who went to Harvard and he was saying, you know, often professors have open hours and professors have open hours and sometimes they don't look at, if I have open hours, which kind of students are coming to those open hours? Certain students, because of the stereotypes that follow them, um, you know, that, that they know, they will avoid to go and see a professor. Why? Because they are afraid of being regarded as incompetent or whatever the case might be. So they are avoiding certain stereotypes from being cemented or being, what is it, validated. 
so they will then um you know avoid even open hours and sometimes even not understanding what that is all about depending on the background the way they're coming from so as professors if you have open hours are you looking at who is actually utilizing them and if your other students are not coming in do you want to reach out and find out why they are not coming in what is the rationale what's going on why are they not using the office hours? So you find that they're not using the office hours. They're probably the ones with the lowest grades in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the, in the class. Um, so what is that? How do you explain that? What is going on? Okay. Um, lack of equity mindedness res resists not seeing uh, racialized consequences or racialized um, or rationalizes them as something else. Okay. Um, and then equity minded exercise agency to produce racial equity. Lack of equity minded does not view racial equity as a personal responsibility. I didn't do anything, it's not my fault. And yet this is not about fault or fault finding or blaming. This is just about acknowledging that this is where we are. And the reason why we are here is because of this that happened in the past. None of us has done that, but none of, all of us have got a responsibility to address those imbalances. And if we do it jointly, we can address some of those imbalances, right? Okay, views the campus as a racialized space and actively self monitors interactions with racially minoritized students. So you walk into William James College, right? You go into the cafe, who do you see? You go into the library, who do you see? You go in the back, who do you see? Right? And why is that? How do you explain that? Right? Remember, we said our mindsets does uh, sort of, you know, shape the experiences we have, what we see and don't see. Okay, um, you know, what we engage with or don't even engage with, right? So lack of competence views the classroom as a utilitarian physical space. I'm gonna skip this uh, case study because of, of our time that as we are running before, um, we are running behind a little bit. So the practice of equity, what are some of the obstacles you find as you're trying to you know, take up agency, develop your own equity mindedness? Um, obviously there will be resistance here and there, but also there will be in your own personal space, you'll have people that are claiming not to see race. So as an individual, understand race critically, just understand that it's there, right? And it has a historical background. Can you dig into the history and begin to understand and appreciate that history? Right, not being able and willing to notice racialized consequences, self change in response to racialized consequences, right? Skating around race, let's avoid talking about race. I mean, we need to talk about race, right? Say no to racially coded language. So, racially coded language, we talk about at risk, we talk about um, 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 what is it, minority, we talk about um, um, uh, what is the other word we use. Um, underrepresented or, you know, so we need to look at what are some of the cause we're talking about the US being a majority minority. So we are still continuing to minoritize people, even though the evidence is fully there, right? It's not a minority, it's a minoritized group as a deliberate, um, you know, sort of act um, to sort of maintain the status quo. So we need to speak about that. Resist calling disaggregated um, data by race and ethnicity let's de disaggregate data let's look into data does not lie i mean this is what we learn right numbers don't lie they're there they are fully present we cannot argue against data and numbers so a lot of the times we avoid the data and the numbers because then we come face to face um, with the reality and what is happening okay substituting race talk with poverty okay racial inequality is a consequence of slavery, slavery and conquest it's not a poverty issue right and then the perverseness of white privilege and institutionalized racism. I said earlier on, I'm so glad to be studying at William James College at such a point, um, at such a time as this, that I am actually ahead of the curve. In South Africa, we have a lot of these issues. We don't sit and talk about this. <laughs> There's no platform for us to be doing this. So I'm so glad to be joining you guys and your willingness and openness to say it's hard but let's talk about it and see where we get if there's an opportunity for us to, you know, even if we make babe steps or even if it's just a small shift, if it happens at all, okay. And then remediating whiteness and practices and then um, the incapacity to see institutional racism in familiar routines, self-remediate of routine, routines and practices, the myth of universalism, we are not the same, we are not equal. So be critically risk conscious, right? Um, seeing racial inequities as a reflection of academic deficiency, examining our practices, why they work for a particular group of people and they don't work for a particular group of, of, of people. We have to um, you know, assess our own um, sort of practices. Wow, that was a quick one. I know I tend to speak very, very fast. And so I hope you were able to hear me in my mumbling uh, and um, you know, going through this um, you know, very, very fast. 
Um, thank you for those who have stayed right through with us. And